In a sheltered cove off the eastern coast of Canada, a modern superstructure takes shape. The heaviest oil platform ever constructed. Designed to survive one of the harshest environments in the world. 80-foot waves, sub-zero temperatures, and multi-million ton icebergs guard a three billion barrel oil field. Many men have died seeking to claim this treasure. Soon, a state-of-the-art oil platform will take to these treacherous waters, hoping to conquer an ocean never before defeated and become the first superstructure to survive the Grand Banks in a deadly quest for oil. Autumn, 1991. Near St. John's, Newfoundland, a massive superstructure sprawls out along the edge of the North Atlantic. Each day, 3,000 workers brave 30 degree temperatures and Arctic winds to complete a monumental task, the construction of the Hibernia GBS. When it's finished, Powerful tugs will tow this huge oil rig 200 miles out to sea. There, it will become a city above the waves, the home of 280 workers attempting to extract 615 million barrels of oil from the bottom of the North Atlantic. If those workers are to succeed and survive, engineers must build an oil platform unlike any other. Most oil rigs float on the surface of the sea, but a GBS is a fundamentally different design. GBS stands for gravity-based structure, a colossal concrete tower cemented to the ocean floor. From this concrete base rise four 360-foot concrete and steel shafts, strong enough to hold a 37,000-ton platform 100 feet above the sea. When finished, this modern technological wonder will stand 735 feet tall and weigh over 1.2 million tons, nearly as tall as the Golden Gate Bridge and three times heavier. It will take seven years to build the Hibernia GBS at a cost of four and a half billion dollars, four times the amount spent on building the world's tallest skyscraper, the Petronas Towers in Malaysia. The giant rig is being designed and built by Canada's Hibernia Corporation, one of the world's largest oil consortiums. The project is so huge that no one construction company can do all the work in seven years. Building the Hibernia GBS must be a worldwide effort. While Hibernia builds the oil rig's massive concrete base in Newfoundland, Construction firms in Italy and South Korea will build the platform's upper structures, giant steel modules where the oil workers will work and live. Seagoing barges will tow the 8,000-ton modules across the oceans for final assembly with the base in Newfoundland. The first challenge facing the builders of the GBS was finding a place to build it. A GBS must be built at the water's edge because moving such a huge structure over land would be impossible. Hibernia Corporation chose a coastal inlet called Bull Arm, 80 miles northwest of St. John's, as the best place to build their giant rig. Bull Arm's channel was deep enough to allow the finished GBS to be towed out to sea, while its tall cliffs and sheltered cove would protect the construction site from Newfoundland's harsh weather. For weeks, crews worked around the clock, transforming Bull Arm into a state-of-the-art construction site. Earth movers had to excavate nine miles of roads just to reach the Bull Arm area. Huge cranes dredged a dry dock construction site at the water's edge. 
Bulldozers dumped over 850,000 cubic yards of rock into the ocean to form the protective barriers surrounding the dry dock site. Now, 400 acres of what was once forest have become a small city of 3,000 people. As they begin their task, these engineers and construction workers know that the oil rig they are building at Bull Arm will have to do more than just pump oil. To extract that oil, the Hibernia GBS will have to survive the most dangerous stretch of ocean in the world. Over the years, many sailors have perished battling the fury of the Grand Banks. Located 200 miles southeast of Newfoundland, this legendary body of water is one of the world's most abundant fishing grounds. It's also the final resting spot for more sunken ships than anywhere else in the world. In 1991, these waters produced what meteorologists described as the perfect storm. 100-foot waves, buffeted by 80-mile-per-hour winds, destroyed two ships and killed seven seamen in just one night. It's a very harsh environment. The wave and the weather are about the same as in the northern North Sea. But in addition to that, we have icebergs. Million-ton icebergs, and thousands of them. They're feared by mariners who call the Grand Banks Iceberg Alley, where the tallest iceberg ever recorded, a 550-foot mountain of ice nearly as tall as the Washington Monument once floated. When it's finished, the Hibernia GBS will be towed 200 miles out to sea and anchored to the ocean floor in the heart of the Grand Banks. Just 150 miles south of where the Hibernia GBS will someday stand lies the Grand Bank's most famous victim. Nearly two miles below the surface, beautifully preserved in the sub-freezing waters, lies the Titanic. This superstructure was once thought to be indestructible. It's an eerie reminder of what can go wrong when confidence in our engineering prowess goes too far. In his 30 years at sea, Captain Mark Turner has seen all too often the consequences of underestimating the North Atlantic's power. There's nothing unsinkable. There's nothing infallible. Uh, man nor machine. So it's, uh, and we have to accept that fact. And, you know, the Titanic uh, is a good example, but it's reality. We are man, and we, uh, we're very weak in many ways. We can build whatever we uh, choose to build. However, uh, against Mother Nature, it's, uh, it's, it's a mere toothpick. Now, 79 years later, the Hibernia's designers know that they must do better than the builders of the Titanic. The GBS must be able to survive the Grand Banks for at least 25 years. Hundreds of lives and billions of dollars are at stake. For beneath these treacherous waters lies a petroleum bonanza. During the early 1970s, marine seismic data and satellite imaging hinted that the Grand Banks might be rich in oil. Geologists suspected that 150 million years ago, the seabed beneath the Grand Banks was a fertile river system teeming with life. As the sea covered the land, layers of sediment buried dead plants and animals. Downward pressure from these layers of rock turn the decaying remains into oil. For 10 years, oil companies drilled hundreds of wells and discovered nothing. Prospecting for oil in this region is like searching for a needle in a haystack. Then, in 1979, the Hibernia Corporation discovered an immense oil field 200 miles off the coast and 12,000 feet below the ocean floor. It would prove to be the seventh largest recoverable petroleum deposit in the world, worth $11 billion to whomever could extract it. For Hibernia, it was the strike of a lifetime. The Hibernia field is, is a giant. Uh, we have over three billion barrels of oil in place. That, that's three billion barrels in the ground. Now, the trick for us as a reservoir team is how do we get that oil out of the ground? In 1982, Hibernia began exploring the new oil field. 
but before the drilling could begin, tragedy struck. One of the first exploratory rigs to arrive over the Hibernia field was an enormous platform called the Ocean Ranger. It stood 340 feet tall, with an upper deck the size of two football fields and a crew of 84 veteran oil workers. Unlike a GBS, the Ocean Ranger was not cemented to the ocean floor. It was designed to float above an undersea oil field, buoyed by eight huge water tanks called ballasts. Floating rigs had operated safely in some of the world's harshest environments. Ocean Ranger was reputed to be the safest oil rig in the world, designed to survive 110-foot waves and 100-mile-per-hour winds. In heavy seas or high winds, water in the ballast tanks could be transferred from one tank to another to stabilize the platform. For 15 months, the Ocean Ranger successfully withstood the Grand Bank's onslaught of wind, ice, and wave. But on February 15, 1982, the unthinkable suddenly became a reality. It was cold, it was freezing spray conditions, uh, extreme weather conditions, um, sea conditions were between 50 and 60 feet. Everybody was trying to work as best they could, but uh, the weather conditions were so extreme, it, was, it made things close to impossible. 80 mile an hour winds and 55 foot waves pounded the 25,000 ton Ocean Ranger. The crew radioed for help. Controllers worked frantically to stabilize the rig as the platform began to list heavily to one side. Emergency crews desperately tried to correct the problem, but the pounding waves made it impossible. The captain issued the order to abandon the rig. 20 minutes passed before the first rescue vessels arrived. The rescuers discovered the platform of the Ocean Ranger floating upside down. The storm's massive waves had flipped the giant rig. For seven days, search teams looked for survivors. They found none. Only 22 bodies were recovered. All 84 men aboard the Ocean Ranger had frozen to death in the icy North Atlantic. We'll never forget about Ocean Ranger here in Newfoundland. Uh, catastrophes such as those, uh, I think, will stay etched in all of our minds. As they build the Hibernia GBS, the workers are haunted by the terrible fate of the capsized rig. Almost everybody working at Bull Arm lost a friend or relative on the Ocean Ranger. But the disaster has also inspired the designers of the Hibernia GBS to construct the safest platform possible. They know the rig will have to survive 100-foot waves, hurricane-strength winds, and a collision with a million-ton iceberg, the largest iceberg ever recorded, 200 feet taller and five times heavier than the Statue of Liberty. Scientists must learn more about the true strength of their icy enemy. They must embark on an unusual journey, an experiment never before attempted. A quest to fathom the power of the ice. The construction of the Hibernia GBS has united American and Canadian oil companies in an historic alliance. Together with the Canadian government, they're investing over $4 billion in a search to understand the power of icebergs and construct the world's safest oil rig. The world's first oil platform capable of withstanding a collision with a massive iceberg. From January to June, any ship navigating the Grand Banks must steer clear of icebergs. Something easier said than done. 85% of an iceberg's mass lies hidden beneath the waves. Between 10 and 20,000 form in Greenland and the Canadian Arctic each year. Carried by a strong southern current, almost 1,000 icebergs drift through the North Atlantic. The icebergs begin to melt as they reach the warmer waters of the Grand Banks. But a million-ton berg, the biggest ever seen, could take up to two months to disappear completely. 
Ships can steer clear of icebergs, but the Hibernia GBS can't. Its massive underwater base, the gravity base structure, is permanently cemented to the ocean's floor. The enormous weight of the GBS will ensure that the Hibernia will never capsize like the Ocean Ranger. But this stability has a price. By making Hibernia immovable, the GBS design virtually assures that the giant rig will someday be rammed by a drifting iceberg. My fear really is the, just the unknown of the ice. There are so many unknown variables about it with regards to frequencies, with regards to movement. Determined to fathom an iceberg's destructive force, Scientists from the Center for Cold Ocean Resource Engineering, or SeaCore, devise a unique experiment. Never before has the impact of an iceberg been measured in a real environment. Only small samples have been crushed in laboratory experiments. To test the power of moving ice, SeaCore scientists decide to ram icebergs into an island. In the grand scheme of things, it's certainly not a 100,000 ton iceberg. Um, we were talking pieces of maybe 1,000 tons, maybe up to 2,000 tons, something like that, which is still a fair sized chunk of ice. Nobody knows for certain how size, speed, and buoyancy will affect the force exerted by an iceberg when it collides with a stationary structure. To measure this, Sea Corps scientist Greg Crocker and a team of engineers build a 21 by 21 foot panel and attach it to the side of a remote island in northern Newfoundland. Half underwater and half above, this metal panel uses electronic sensors to record the force an iceberg exerts as it strikes the cliff. Only one problem remains, capturing and towing an iceberg into the panel. Crocker and his ice wranglers search for a likely candidate. Their plan is to attach an anchor to a bird and tow it to shore using a strong tugboat. But this proves difficult. The anchors generally didn't hold. Um, the, the towing vessel had about a 10-ton pull, and it was enough to, to essentially pull the anchors out of the, um, out of the ice. Sea Corps scientists reevaluate their approach and decide to lasso the iceberg instead. By encircling the berg with a rope connected to the back of a tug, they tow mammoth chunks of ice to their island laboratory and send them crashing into the electronic panel. At first, the results seem baffling. Sensors in the electronic panel recorded less force from the impacts of giant icebergs than from far smaller ice samples tested in labs. But Seacore scientists think there's a simple explanation. In the wild, icebergs are constantly melting. As they melt, they weaken. Although it looks rock hard, a 100,000 ton iceberg has many weak points within its seemingly solid mass. When a berg of this size collides with a stationary object, its weak points diminish the force of the impact. Since previous laboratory tests had used only small, compacted ice samples, researchers had remained unaware of these critical weaknesses of larger bergs. The SeaCore experiments proved for the first time that internal weaknesses significantly diminishes the force of an iceberg's impact. No one had ever directly measured the forces and pressures that an iceberg exerts on a structure when they interact. And you can calculate on paper what they might be till the cows come home, but there's a lot of confidence built up when you actually have some data which tells you in the real world what those forces are going to be. The revolutionary results of SeaCore's iceberg impact tests reassured Hibernia GBS designers that their platform could survive a collision with a six million ton iceberg. But Crocker warns people of becoming overconfident. After all, six million tons of ice could crush an entire city block. You need to design for a certain ice load and some acceptable level of risk because you can never reduce risk to zero. We don't try and deny that those risks are there. We try and design structures that are safe, 
within that environment. Over 30 GBS platforms operate in the North Sea off Scotland and Norway, where icebergs never come. These rigs have tall, slender base frames designed to offer minimal resistance to powerful waves. An iceberg's force would crush them. To extract oil from the Hibernia field, a rig must sit directly in the iceberg's path. The Hibernia's designers must invent a new defense against this deadly threat. They decide to build a huge ice wall surrounding the underwater base of the platform. At first, the ice wall appears to be a disorganized mesh of steel rebar and concrete. But it's actually an intricate plan, inspired by designs which strengthen the foundations of skyscrapers to withstand a magnitude 8.0 earthquake. Following a detailed map, workers place each steel beam in an exact location. These beams will help to reinforce the strength of the concrete. After 69,000 tons of these beams are set in place, workers pour high-strength concrete around them. It's essential that the pouring of the 400,000 tons of concrete be precise. If it dries unevenly, a weak spot can develop, leading to the complete collapse of the Hibernia GBS at sea. A process known as slip forming ensures a perfect pour. Slip forming calls for building a wooden platform around the inside edge of the GBS. Workers pour concrete through holes in the platform and use metal chutes to distribute it evenly around the steel bars. As the concrete dries, a computer raises the wooden platform, creating an even pour. For three months, this process continues. The outer walls rise nearly three feet per day. Slowly, the revolutionary design of the Hibernia GBS takes shape. Four and a half foot thick walls soar 280 feet high. The jagged outer wall is actually 16 reinforced concrete teeth designed to break apart an iceberg if it collides with the rig. Inside the massive concrete shell, engineers install a 50-foot thick ice belt. This gap between the outer and inner walls of the base will someday be filled with over 550,000 tons of iron ore. When the GBS is in its final position at sea, engineers will pour the iron ore mixed with seawater into the ice belt. It's a protection for the entire facility. I mean, it, it's, it's the people, it's, it's the drilling, it's, everything is protected by that ice wall. Everybody always says when you look at that ice wall against an iceberg, we, we think we'll, we'll win. If an iceberg strikes the Hibernia GBS, the outer teeth will chew away the ice, while the inner ice belt will absorb the iceberg's impact, distributing the force throughout the base. But before the GBS faces icebergs on the open sea, its five upper modules must be completed. In these steel homes, the 280 men and women aboard the Hibernia rig will eat, sleep, and work for three weeks at a time. They'll face dangers oil riggers never encounter on land. They'll be isolated in the middle of the North Atlantic, 200 miles from the nearest rescue station. Anyone who would dare to live and work in this deadly environment must first undergo a grueling, frightening ordeal. A rite of passage that could make the difference between life and death. 400,000 tons of concrete poured around 90,000 tons of steel, the Hibernia GBS stands ready for battle. Its builders have designed its jagged edged ice wall to defeat the most powerful icebergs in the Grand Banks. The GBS is so enormous it seems indestructible. But even superstructures are only as good as the people who operate them. Not even cutting-edge technology can guarantee the lives of workers aboard a platform in the middle of the Grand Banks. It's not a, uh, an environment in which 
we are designed to operate as, as, as animals ourselves, so the, the ocean is a, an unforgiving place to be if, uh, if you don't take account of what dangers it can present. In 1982, the Ocean Ranger disaster taught Newfoundland's oil workers the deadly consequences of being unprepared for an emergency. When their rig capsized, the Ocean Ranger's crew panicked. Terrified workers scrambled to lifeboats and jumped into the freezing water. For all, death came quickly. The temperatures off the uh, Grand Banks can vary to sub-zero, to just above zero. If you are in the water, forget it. You have maybe a minute. 84 men died on Ocean Ranger because they had no idea how to save themselves in an emergency. As a result of that tragedy, all Canadian offshore oil workers must now complete an intensive survival training course before they begin working at sea. The Hibernia Corporation takes the dangers of working in the Grand Banks very seriously. It spends over $2 million each year on survival training. Employees who will operate the Hibernia GBS must undergo a one-week program the most grueling in the industry. It's an exhausting, often frightening ordeal. Those who fail lose their jobs. The offshore survival training course begins by introducing each student to the survival suit. Designed to keep water out and warmth in, these suits will keep a person afloat in the worst sea conditions. In the North Atlantic, an unprotected swimmer will succumb to hypothermia within 15 minutes. A swimmer wearing a survival suit can survive in 20 degree water for six hours. But knowing how to use a survival suit is only a start. Unlike any other survival training in the world, the Hibernia program requires that each student leave the safety of the training pool and experience the cold, brutal reality of the North Atlantic firsthand. Out here, students get a frigid wake-up call. At sea, you have a different uh, attitude. You, you, you realize that, gee, this is the real thing. Uh, I have to perform. I have to. Now my training is actually going to surface, and I've got to use that training. At sea, each student must demonstrate his or her ability to swim in the ocean, jettison life rafts, and board rescue boats. They're taught to work as a team. In the middle of the Grand Banks, teamwork is essential. If one person panics, many may die. Uh, it's better to have a cool mind, appreciate that you work as a team, and that you're as one integral unit. And that way you will survive. You have to think positively. Situations occur. But if you're well trained, you can deal with those situations. And you can save not only your own life, but those of, the, uh, of your friends next to you. To save lives, the Hibernia GBS is equipped with eight state-of-the-art lifeboats. Each lifeboat is self-contained, motorized, and impossible to capsize. They're designed to survive a storm as powerful as the one that destroyed the Ocean Ranger. But mustering everybody to a lifeboat station and launching the craft takes time. Time offshore oil workers may not have. So the oil platform is equipped with three Solantic skyscapes. Located at each lifeboat station, these nylon chutes propel a person 100 feet down to the ocean's surface to a waiting life raft. Using the Solantic skyscapes and the lifeboats, the entire crew can quickly abandon the platform. Unfortunately, a fast evacuation may be necessary. Sitting on top of combustible oil and gas, any oil rig must be prepared for the possibility of a devastating explosion. Tragically, it's happened before. In the early hours of July 6, 1988, the Piper Alpha oil rig in the North Sea exploded. A gas leak ignited an enormous fire which burned for 15 hours. 167 men died, most of them asleep in their beds. 
the rig was completely destroyed. An inquiry into the Piper Alpha disaster concluded that if its workers had been trained in basic firefighting techniques, they might have survived. Working in the middle of the world's angriest ocean, 200 miles from the nearest fire station, oil riggers aboard the Hibernia GBS will have to fight their own fires. To have any chance against a deadly fire, they must be trained in firefighting. Hibernia's workers are not expected to become expert firefighters. Their training will help them prevent a fire from spreading until professional support arrives. If it arrives in time. The journey to Hibernia's isolated home takes 16 hours by boat, an hour and 30 minutes by helicopter. The platform's most vital link to the mainland is also one of the most dangerous means of air travel. More than once, choppers carrying workers to their oil rigs have crashed into the sea. For this reason, any person who will someday fly to the Hibernia GBS must first pass the most frightening test of all, the helicopter dunk tank. The helicopter dunk is, that is the be all in all. This is, the, I think that is the clincher for people. Uh, just the fact of doing uh, several trials of being dipped in a, uh, a prototype of a helicopter and trying to get out through the window. On this final day of their safety training, students experience what everyone hopes will never happen. When a helicopter crashes into the sea, there's very little time to react. To survive, passengers must keep calm and know exactly what to do. Immediately, they have to knock the emergency windows out. If the helicopter sinks, the water pressure will make it impossible to open anything. Then they must suppress their overpowering urge to flee and wait because most helicopters will quickly flip upside down. Only then is it safe to escape. It's amazing how disoriented you are initially because, I mean, everything's turning and all of a sudden you're hanging there upside down. And, and again, it's the training that helps you And because what you find is they said, as we do this, hold on to the window frame. And so when you're upside down, all of a sudden you realize, hey, there's my window frame, I'm oriented. You pull yourself out the window and you're up to the surface. Over 3,000 men and women push themselves through the offshore survival training program each year. Most make it, but when some are faced with the sobering reality of what might go wrong, they walk away. 1% of those who begin the survival training program never make it to the end. Even with all the training and all the safety precautions, the risks seem too great. As the final assembly of the Hibernia at GBS nears, the specter of the Ocean Ranger tragedy rises once again. If the design of this platform isn't perfect, over three times as many lives could be lost. Lots of things can go wrong, and, and uh, we work hard to make sure things don't go wrong. Safety is really number one for us, and I mean, if, if you don't get that right, all these other things don't matter, because we've got you know, 270 people that uh, call that, that little platform out in the middle of the North Atlantic home. Distribution of the waves, solid Trying to understand how powerful waves can capsize oil rigs, Industry investigators decide to recreate the Ocean Ranger disaster. To accomplish this, they turn to the National Research Council of Canada's Institute of Marine Dynamics, or IMD, and its indoor ocean. Nearly as large as a football field, this huge basin holds up to 1.5 million gallons of water. It can accurately recreate the stormiest ocean environment. We'll put a structure or a ship in the basin and we can have waves coming from one or more directions, much like the real ocean. And in addition to that, we can superimpose a current on top of that. Working at a scale of 40 to 1, Institute engineers build a model of the Ocean Ranger rig and place it in the center of the indoor ocean. Using large metal flaps along the edge of the basin, they create a one and a half foot wave the indoor ocean's equivalent of a 60-foot swell. 
to everyone's surprise, the Ocean Ranger stays afloat. Puzzled by this mystery, investigators look for another possible cause. They listen again to the final communications from the crew of the doomed rig and make a crucial discovery. During the fatal storm, an open porthole in the ballast control room allowed water in, short-circuiting the computers. Without computers, workers couldn't operate the ballast tanks, which could stabilize the rig. As it lost balance, its bow dipped down perilously close to the ocean's surface. At IMD, scientists recreate this dangerous imbalance using their model of the Ocean Ranger. Then they send a succession of 60-foot waves hurling towards the model. They hit pay dirt. The Ocean Ranger flips. I think most of the problems with the Ocean Ranger were sort of a combination of incredible bad luck and, and lack of training. In fact, the rig was quite stable. It wanted to stay afloat. It was just a combination of an extremely large wave that ultimately flipped the rig over or an exceptionally poor ballast condition. The sobering revelations from IMD's investigation strengthened Hibernia's resolve to build the safest oil platform in the world, a rig capable of surviving 100-foot waves in the open seas. The platform must pass one more crucial test or risk being battered to pieces by the fury of the North Atlantic. From Italy and South Korea, enormous barges arrive off the coast of Newfoundland, transporting the modules that make up the upper platform of the Hibernia oil rig. Each of these 8,000-ton steel compartments weighs 1,000 tons more than the Eiffel Tower. Carefully, workers offload the five modules onto a pier and spend seven months welding and bolting them together. United, the entire topside platform weighs 37,000 tons, standing 370 feet tall. Once mated to the GBS, the Hibernia rig will become a 1.2 million ton superstructure, towering 735 feet from top to bottom. But even an oil rig of this size is destined to receive a battery from the huge swells of the Grand Banks. Over time, repeated blows of powerful waves may fatally damage the rig. To avoid waves constantly crashing into its underside, the platform will hover 100 feet above the ocean's surface. The lives of 300 workers and the success of a $4 billion project rest upon this design strategy. Before they mate the platform to the GBS, engineers need proof that their design will be wave resistant. Once again, they turn to the indoor ocean in St. John's, Newfoundland. Here they will test whether the distance from the bottom of the upper platform to the sea's surface is high enough to prevent waves from battering the platform's underbelly. It's much better to fail here or, or find out the events that are going to cause a failure here than it is in real life, of course. I mean, model tests are not cheap, but they're certainly cheaper than the real, real thing. The full fury of the Grand Banks is unleashed in miniature. The unique design of the Hibernia GBS sends waves crashing higher than any other oil platform ever has. Engineers are worried. They send 75-foot waves, the largest swells generated by most Atlantic storms, barreling towards the platform. When they strike the enormous base, the waves cascade upward. But the underside of the topside platform remains untouched. The Hibernia GBS defeats the indoor ocean. Reassured that the platform's design will survive the force of even massive waves in the Grand Banks, engineers prepare to connect the topside platform to the sunken base. The mating procedure begins with the flooding of the dry dock construction site and the tow out of the GBS to deeper water one mile from shore. 
There, workers add water to the ballast tanks, lowering the GBS until only 18 feet of the four 364-foot shafts are above water. They position the platform over the sunken GBS with two huge barges. Lining up the two structures perfectly, they slowly raise the base to meet the topside platform. The GBS is already in position at the deep water site. Only the positioning of the platform over the base remains. For 48 hours, five tugboat captains position two gigantic barges under the pier holding the five modules. They must evenly distribute the weight of the topside platforms across both barges to ensure a safe trip to the sunken GBS. It will take 12 hours to position the topside platform over the base. Precision is essential. We had to float at something like uh, two kilometers, 1.6 or 1.7 kilometers, and then uh, position it uh, within uh, a thumbnail over uh, another structure that's equally as massive, but weighs something like 550,000 tons. The barges creep towards the sunken base at barely one and a half miles an hour. They must float to within 20 inches of the connection point. As the top sides reach the GBS, a winch system takes over, connecting the barges to the sunken base, moving the five modules into exact position. Engineers carefully check the placement. They believe it's right on the nose and give the order to raise the GBS. Workers pump water out of the GBS ballast tanks. Slowly, the base rises up to meet the topside platform. Five years after its construction began, the Hibernia GBS oil platform stands as a completed structure. As more water leaves the ballast tanks, the Hibernia platform rises further above the sea, a new giant in the region. The mating procedures were fantastic. It was an unbelievable feat. Uh, and I, I, I sincerely believe that, yes, it can certainly last 15 years or 20 years. Towering over the coastal cliffs of eastern Newfoundland, the Hibernia GBS seems indestructible. This superstructure of concrete and steel now weighs over 600,000 tons and stands 735 feet four times taller and 10 times heavier than the Titanic. With such weight and height, it would seem that here finally is a man-made structure capable of defeating the Grand Banks. But one more challenge remains. The Hibernia GBS must leave the calm, protected waters where it was built. For the first time, the platform will be exposed to the extreme conditions of the North Atlantic's open sea. Only then will its builders know whether they have succeeded or failed. Against the rugged coastline of Newfoundland, the Hibernia GBS stands triumphant, a modern superstructure ready to tackle the harshest ocean in the world. But before the GBS can pump a single barrel of oil, engineers must install it in the middle of the Grand Banks. A 400-mile journey straight through the heart of Iceberg Alley. Before the tow-out can take place, weather conditions must be exactly right. The Hibernia GBS isn't designed to move easily through the water like a ship. Moving it to the Grand Banks will be like towing a 75-story skyscraper out to sea. If strong winds strike en route, the 370-foot tall topside platform will act like a giant sail and could capsize the entire structure. As Hibernia officials monitor the weather, nine of the most powerful tugs in the world arrive in bull arm. They'll guide the platform out of its home of six years and into the North Atlantic. Although the Hibernia oil field is only 200 miles from Bull Arm, the GBS must travel twice that far to get there. It will follow the coastline to avoid rough seas and icebergs. Forecasters must predict at least 10 days of clear weather before the tow-out can begin. 
But day after day, the seas remain too rough for travel. Along the shores of Newfoundland, locals gathered a bit of dew to their giant neighbor, only to find it's still at bull arm. Hibernia officials can afford to wait. They've budgeted for just such a delay. Finally, after three months, the weather clears and the tugs are ready to go. The GBS embarks upon its perilous journey. Six tugs position themselves in front of the platform. They'll provide the power to pull it forward. Meanwhile, three tugs take up positions behind the Hibernia to provide steering, much like a rudder in a small boat. With good weather, calm seas, and a well-mapped course, the Hibernia GBS has no problem navigating out of her protective cove. Traveling at two miles per hour, she's able to cover nearly 60 miles per day. But as the platform reaches its final destination, a storm kicks up high seas. Tugboat captains halt the tow out. We arrived at the Grand Banks in very good time, but then we had to wait seven days before we towed it into position because it was very shallow water. Although they're more than 200 miles offshore, the Grand Banks are not very deep. Beneath them lies North America's continental shelf. Depth in the Grand Banks can be as shallow as 180 feet. Engineers plan to anchor the Hibernia GBS to an underwater peak just 260 feet below the surface. But the oil rig's concrete base extends over 250 feet deep. As the tugboat captains maneuver it into position, there will be only 10 feet of clearance between the GBS and the ocean floor. This will be the most dangerous time of all. Large waves or gusty winds could make the rig bob violently in the water and send it crashing into the seabed. The storm rages for almost a week. The tugs can only wait. Finally, the weather clears. The tugs begin the final phase of the tow out. For 70 tense hours, tugboat captains carefully maneuver the Hibernia toward a target zone just 33 feet long, no bigger than a semi-trailer truck. Remarkably, they touch down within five feet of the center mark. But before celebrating, workers must first lower the Hibernia GBS to the ocean floor and add the solid ballast to the interior ice belt. This had never been done before. We planned a little over a month to do this and it took us too, close to two months to, to do this. Above water, barges carrying 550,000 tons of iron ore begin to transfer the solid ballast to the GBS. Gently, the tower sinks toward the sea floor. As it hits the soft mud below, 120 concrete skirts encircling the underbelly of the GBS penetrate seven feet into the sand. Uh, the skirt is like a bunch of, almost like a cookie cutter uh, that is pushed into the bottom. And the top of the, the structure is sitting on the top of the cookie cutter. And then once they're in place, they, uh, they take out the mud that is surrounded by the cookie cutter and then fill it up with cement. And that is the thing that sort of glues the structure to the, to the bottom. Barges extract 29,000 cubic yards of water and mud from underneath the GBS, while workers insert 100,000 tons of concrete between the skirts. As the cement dries, it glues the base to the bottom of the ocean, and the Hibernia GBS is ready to extract the first oil from the Grand Banks. The Hibernia's crew will drill over 80 wells 12,000 feet below the ocean floor. Some of those wells will extract oil. Others will pump water and gas back into the reservoir to help maintain its geological stability. Finding the oil, however, isn't as easy as it sounds. 
But what a puzzle you have here. You're trying to figure out what's happening three miles down with, with very little information in, in all reality. Using state-of-the-art computer technology, the Hibernia Reservoir team can work at record speeds. As they drill into the oil field, scientists on shore can watch in real time exactly what's happening. Analyzing the data as a team, they're able to make immediate adjustments which allow for a more productive well. This revolutionary process pays off quickly. In just six months, the Hibernia GBS delivers its first tanker full of oil, one month ahead of schedule. It's a tribute to the hard work of over 8,000 men and women all over the world who built the Hibernia GBS. It's also a victory for modern engineering over a hostile environment, tempered by an awareness of the ocean's never-ending threat. It's a spec. We're all specs. It's a very small piece of equipment out there on the North Atlantic. But for now, the builders of the Hibernia GBS can savor their accomplishment. The platform's success has already sparked a search for other lucrative oil reservoirs in the Grand Banks. Geologists now speak of drilling in even more remote regions, like the Arctic, long thought to be too dangerous for oil platforms. The future of the offshore oil industry rests upon this million-ton superstructure anchored in one of the deadliest oceans in the world. As it towers above the waves, the Hibernia GBS is a proud symbol of human ingenuity's triumph over nature's challenge. On a Stone Age island at the ends of the earth, is an astonishing superstructure whose very existence defies imagination. To build it, men climbed mountains no one could climb, gave their lives building roads no one could build, dragged the world's biggest trucks and shovels where they could not go, thousands of feet into the sky, into a deadly realm of blinding fogs and perilous quests for staggering riches. They did it all to mine a hidden fortune, a mountain made of gold. of satellites, cell phones, and cyberspace, there are still a few hidden places left on Earth. One of them is Irian Jaya. A land born of fire, crowned by ice, where pathless jungles swelter in equatorial heat where freezing mists envelop soaring mountains, and men still live untouched by time. Some 75 miles from its jungle shores, a wall of mountains soars to 16,000 feet, the highest peaks between the Andes and the Himalayas. Atop them gleams a natural wonder Magnificent glaciers spawned by the Ice Age some 15,000 years ago, only five degrees south of the equator. Just below these glaciers lies a wonder of man. Two gigantic mines called Grasberg and Ernstberg, less than two miles apart and nearly 14,000 feet high. Before it's exhausted, this megamine may yield more gold than the entire California gold rush. Many call it the most spectacular mineral deposit ever found. It's a mountain of ore. 
but it's not just that, it's also a root of ore. So like if you had a tooth, you know, and, and you can see the part that sticks above the gum, that, that's what most people mine. But if you extracted that tooth and it's got that long root on it, we've got that as well, and it's also full of ore. So you're looking at a vertical mile of, of gold ore body. It's just incredible. Grasberg and Erzberg lie some 700 miles north of Australia and 2,000 miles east of Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, in the western half of New Guinea, second largest island in the world. Once a Dutch colony, Irian Jaya is now an Indonesian province and home of some of the world's richest deposits of copper and gold. But Irian Jaya is not surrendering its treasures without a fight. The Grossberg Erzberg mining complex took 20 years to build cost more than three billion dollars and took its toll in human life. At its dizzying altitudes, men must work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to make mining profitable in one of the most remote locations on Earth. The tough part about this was is that Mother Nature implanted this wonderful ore body at 13,000 feet when she said, come get it, and we had to go get it. When you go up there to try to explain it to somebody, the best way is that you're going to walk away with your mouth open. You're going to be a gog. Uh, people are going to say, how in the world did you do that? This incredible story begins with one man, a Dutch geologist named Jean-Jacques Dozy. In 1993, aged 84, he returned to visit the mine his courage made possible. In 1936, 27 year old Dozy vowed to be the first man to reach Irian Jaya's tropical glaciers. It seemed a reckless boast. Europeans had been launching expeditions to Irian Jaya's hinterland for 300 years. None had broken through the deadly labyrinth of jungle between the mountains and the sea. The only way to make your way inland is by river. Now, the problem with the rivers is that you don't know where the rivers are leading. This was a problem with the very first expeditions that came to this area that tried to reach the glaciers that took the wrong river. They spent a year and a half trying to get to the glacier just because it took the wrong river. It seemed unlikely that Dozy would succeed where so many others had failed. But Dozy possessed a recent 20th century invention, which lifted him over the jungle and showed him the way to go. Dozy had the advantage of knowing what the terrain looked like from the air. Once you knew the terrain, once you knew which river to take, once you knew what the lay of the land fairly well, you could move a lot faster. On October 29, 1936, Dozy, two friends, and eight porters started up the Iqua River. They paddled to where the mountains began and started walking. We just walked up as far as we could, started cutting, followed a trail, made a trail, and the higher we came, the more tougher it became. After a while, they didn't know where they were anymore because they had aerial photographs up to a point, but then the jungle gets pretty steep and you're not quite sure how far you have to go. Exhausted as he was, the geologist Dozy took time to sketch a peculiar rock formation. You had a blackish, black rock wall, a black mountain with uh, green and blue large uh, specks on it. Uh, and, well, being a geologist, I of course recognized that there should be some copper into, this, into that rock, but at that moment I had, I had to go on. Dozy had no way of knowing how right he was. 
In fact, he had stumbled upon one of the greatest geological discoveries of all time. Three million years ago, a series of volcanic eruptions injected riches into the mountains of Irian Jaya. The erupting volcanoes opened up cracks deep within the earth. Propelled by hot gases, molten magma from the earth's core flowed into these fissures, carrying with it unusually high concentrations of copper and gold. One of them was Jean-Jacques Dozy's strange black mountain, the biggest copper deposit ever discovered above the surface of the earth. Dozy collected a few ore samples from the curious Copper Mountain. On his field maps, he named it Erzberg, Dutch for Mountain of Ore. Back in Holland, he wrote a report describing his discovery. But his timing could not have been worse. Dozy published his report in the summer of 1939. On September 3rd, World War II began. While Holland suffered under Nazi occupation, the Erzberg Report gathered dust. 20 years later, a Dutch geologist gave it to Forbes Wilson. Wilson was chief mining engineer for Freeport, an American mining company. Forbes was a man who had to be the best or the biggest or the fastest, or the smartest uh, with anything and everything. And indeed he was in many areas. That's part of the reason I think that we today are mining in uh, the Erzberg complex. Wilson was looking for nickel deposits. But when he read Dozy's description of the Erzberg, he forgot all about nickel. After Forbes Wilson read the Dozy report and it became part of his being, we can almost say that it became a holy grail for him. He was a man, 50 years old at the time, and a heavy smoker. He gave up smoking, got himself in shape, and organized this expedition. He had to find for, and see for himself Erzberg. On May 30th, 1960, Forbes Wilson plunged into the jungle, determined to reach the Erzberg. He asked his friend and fellow geologist, Delos Flint, to come along. Flint jumped at the chance to take part in the adventure of a lifetime, despite the perils of trekking through Irian Jaya. The worst thing there were the leeches. And if you looked at, at a uh, bush, the leech would be there trying to find something warm that uh, he could uh, attach to. We'd always get a few. And one time I found one on the roof of my mouth. If I hadn't been busy talking, I guess I wouldn't have had it happen. But leeches weren't the only unfriendly locals. Only one year after the Forbes Wilson expedition, the explorer Michael Rockefeller vanished in Irian Jaya. Some believe the son of Governor Nelson Rockefeller drowned or was killed by sharks, but others are convinced he was eaten by cannibals. When Dill Flint and Forbes Wilson first encountered Irian's indigenous peoples, they felt threatened, but for a different reason. Even though you've seen pictures of them with their uh, gourds covering their privates, the first time you see it, it's a, a real shock. You feel very, uh, well, unequipped, as the way I would put it. They uh, came in with all their finery and charged like they were being uh, uh, arrayed in war, which sort of gave you, whoop, you know, but uh, you, they turned it into a dance and everybody was happy. On June 16, 1960, after 18 days of hard travel, Del Flint and Forbes Wilson found the Erzberg. A surface inspection convinced them that it was indeed a mineralogical marvel, thickly laced with enormous chunks of the yellow copper ore known as chalcopyrite. 
there'd be blobs that uh, up to four feet across or perhaps even longer that were solid calcopyrite. And when you saw that, I, it was just, you boggled your mind. You, ooh. Uh, when I first got there and got up on the thing, I just screamed like Tarzan. This, you, God, I'm mine, all mine. <laughs> the two American geologists had proved that Erzberg was really a mountain of ore. But Jean-Jacques Dozy had called it a mountain of ore on the moon. Who could build a mine in one of the most inaccessible places on Earth? In the 1960s, Erian Jaya's mountain of copper and gold appeared as spectacular as Forbes Wilson believed it would be. Rock samples from Erzberg had one of the highest copper contents ever found. Yet no matter how rich it was, Erzberg was virtually impossible to reach. But on April 5, 1967, with authorization from the Indonesian government, Freeport decided to try. To build its mine, Freeport hired Bechtel, a California engineering firm with a reputation for building things in places no one else could. But even Bechtel's engineers were stunned by Irian Jaya. To even reach Erzberg, engineers would have to build a 75-mile road through some of the toughest terrain on Earth. First, through the labyrinth of mangrove swamps hugging the coast. Then, through the seemingly impenetrable jungles of the lowlands. And finally, over mountains that rose like walls up to 16,000 feet high. They had no airport, no seaport, and no place for helicopters to land. Well, the first thing was for, uh, to build a dock area and to put in a road. Well, both the dock area and the mangroves and the, and the beginning of the road, you had to drop everything down from helicopters. You had to drop people down from helicopters to saw off trees to make platforms where the choppers could land to bring in supplies. They would get their people into choppers, put them in a hoist with a chainsaw. The people would come down from the chopper with their chainsaw going. Now, they, remember, they're dropping down on a solid canvas of treetops. So they would have to cut their way down to the floor of the jungle as the helicopter tries to hover and the master who's inside the helicopter is watching to make sure that this guy doesn't start bouncing around back and forth. You can be slammed against the tree. People have been killed this way. As crews cleared helicopter landing sites, road building began. Workers came from all over the world to take on the incredible challenge. Among them was a young Indonesian from Sumatra named Ilyas Hamid. When I was selected to come here, I was a little bit afraid because I heard there were almost no people in this place. And also some rumors that people in this area ate other human beings. However, when I shared my concern with my family, they gave me their support and told me to leave my faith to God. Engineers dredged tons of gravel from riverbeds, trying to create the foundation of a road. In the worst places, it took as much as 50 cubic yards of gravel to build one foot of road. Overnight, while the road builders slept, the road they had built the day before often sank into the swamp. In places, Bechtel built two miles of road for every mile that survived. Working in this place was very difficult. I thought that after digging mud for three to six feet, I would get to hard soil. But in fact, we were still finding mud after we had dug more than 30 feet. In one day, we could make only 15 to 20 feet of road. 
As the road inched forward, landslides buried tractors. Trucks fell into rivers. Helicopters sank into swamps. And that was the easy part. 50 miles from the coast, the sheer wall of Irian's backbone rose up as steep as 70 degrees. The mountaintops were razor-sharp ridges, in places only two feet wide, with vertical drops on either side. Yet 25 miles of road had to be built over those mountains if Erzberg was to be reached. If you're willing to put enough S-curves into the road, you can put a road up almost any slope. Then the problem is to put the road along the ridge crest. Now what uh, Bechtel did is from helicopters, they dropped down very small bulldozers, bulldozers that are the size of small lawnmowers. They would drop these down, and these bulldozers would cut off the top part of the ridgeback. And then slightly larger bulldozers would come in. Bechtel went through six size bulldozers between these very small lawnmower type bulldozers until they got to the big boys the size of a house, which eventually did build the road. So you started getting a flat ridge line, and then you started going down in S curves, going down to the bottom. Tremendously difficult. Bulldozers would fall over the edge. Who knows where they ended up? The bulldozers pushed forward. Drivers kept one eye on the dizzying drops below them and the other on the crumbling cliffs above. No one knew if he would live or die. One day, my bulldozer broke down and the helicopter could not bring a spare part. The next morning, my friend, an American whose bulldozer was working, replaced me as the leader of the work. After only half an hour, the land he was working on collapsed, and his bulldozer slid down into a canyon. As he fell, a tree branch speared him right through the chest and killed him. By 1971, after nearly four years, victory seemed in sight. But seven miles short of Erzberg, the road builders ran into a towering 2,000-foot cliff. Bechtel's engineers had an ingenious solution. A helicopter carried a 9,000-foot-long nylon rope to a platform at the future mine. With this bolted in place, workers hoisted up ever thicker ropes until the line was strong enough to hold steel cables as thick as a man's arm. This web of steel became the longest aerial tramway of its day and one of the steepest. Its cars rose 2,000 feet in less than a mile. But no one anticipated the mysterious vibrations that shook its cables. Vibrations would be so strong they had to stop everything because the, the ore cars would vibrate right off the cable. They call in a Swiss mathematician. He said these cables are like the strings on a very fine violin. If they're a bit out of tune, the violin sounds lousy. He recalculated speeds and stresses. Since then, everything has gone very smooth. With the tram in place, Freeport could lift men and equipment all the way to the mine entrance. At the tramway's base, Bechtel built mine offices and an ore processing mill. After five years of battling Arian Jaya, the Erzberg mine was ready for operation at a cost of over a billion dollars. But engineers had to solve another problem. How were they going to get thousands of tons of ore down the mountain? By 1972, engineers had met the challenge of building a road through Irian Jaya. Miners could begin digging the huge deposits of copper and gold discovered there. 
Soon, they were mining thousands of tons of ore per day. But they also faced a new challenge, how to ship that ore from Irian Jaya's faraway mountains to the rest of the world. Trucks and trams couldn't carry enough ore per day to make Erzberg profitable. Engineers came up with a simple solution to moving the ore. Let it fall. Newly mined ore begins its journey to the world through a series of ore passes. These giant chutes send it plummeting 2,000 feet to the base of the tram. As the ore hits the ground, it breaks into smaller pieces, making it easier to move. Conveyor belts rush the fallen ore to a mill. Inside the mill, it pours into the world's largest ore crushers, some nearly 40 feet in diameter. Whirling inside these enormous drums, thousands of steel balls attack the ore grinding it into smaller rocks, and finally, into a powder. At the mill, workers mix powdered ore with water to create a concentrated liquid slurry of copper and gold. But this concentrate is still 10,000 feet high and 70 miles from the sea. Gravity gets it there. Mill workers pump the concentrate into a pipeline running beside the road. After 20 miles, the descent becomes so steep that gravity alone carries the concentrate another 50 miles to the sea. Piled in barns by the ocean, awaiting shipment to smelters around the world, the product of hundreds of millions of dollars and years of hazardous work looks like nothing but a huge pile of dirt. But in fact, it's pay dirt. When it's smelted, each ton yields nearly 700 pounds of copper, 30 grams of gold, and another 30 grams of silver. We mine the ore at 14,000 feet, and we sell it at sea level. And that's a 75-mile distance between those two. Nobody else does that. In December 1972, the first ship loaded with ore from the Erzberg mine sailed from Irian Jaya. By the 1980s, Erzberg was a huge open pit mine. The ancient glacial meadow sketched by Jean-Jacques Dozy echoed with the sounds of one of the world's most ambitious mining operations. But Freeport knew that big as it was, Erzberg wouldn't last forever. The company sent geologists deep into the surrounding mountains to search for an even bigger body of ore, a mother load that would make mining in Irian Jaya profitable long after Erzberg had played out. It was a dirty, dangerous, thrilling job for a few exceptional men and one exceptional woman. We spent many times really running for the helicopter. <laughs> and you'd, you'd be just exhausted and you'd just get in and almost collapse, but it was either that or spend the night and it was very cold up there at night. In the early 1970s, Frank Nelson was one of the first geologists to explore the wilds of Irian Jaya. Working with him was his wife, Eleanor, also a geologist. Our first uh, chore really was developing a map, uh, first topographic and at the same time geologic. We had one camera that we mounted below the helicopter that Frank would work on a remote control. And I took handheld pictures out the, the door of the helicopter, just open the door and point the camera out. <laughs> and sort of surprise our drillers sometimes. They'd say, who in hell is that up there? And Ellie'd be sitting there at the edge of the seat with her feet off the edge and, and shooting straight down and trying to get a, a montage, uh, a mosaic of, of the area. 
And uh, even these big, rough, tough Maori drillers, they were impressed by that. <laughs> so that is one cool woman. <laughs> People were not uh, familiar with the natives. Uh, and we were lucky enough to have more direct day-by-day -day contact with them. And you got to really like them. Uh, a lot of people feared them. They looked pretty uh, dramatic, I mean, with painted faces and, you know, bones in the nose and uh, bows and arrows, and they were you know, ominous looking. But actually, when you got to know them, they had a great sense of humor. We used to ask them for the fun of it, and they always would say, well, not us, but over in the other canyon, those fellas, yeah, they makan orang, you know, they eat people. And they go over there and say, oh, not us, but those, those fellas had. By the 1980s, the Erzberg open pit mine was no longer profitable and was shut down. But by then, Frank and Eleanor Nelson and other geologists had discovered huge underground copper deposits nearby. It was a rich find, but it wasn't the mother load Freeport had been searching for. In fact, in the mid-1980s, Freeport almost quit mining in Arian Jaya as a new technology threatened to destroy the world demand for copper. Fiber optic cable was revolutionizing world telephone systems. Many believed it would soon make copper telephone wire obsolete. But in 1984, a new chief executive took over at Freeport. James Robert Moffat was a field geologist who'd spent years exploring for oil and minerals. He wasn't ready to give up on Arian Jaya. He believed in the mother lode. I looked at New Guinea and saw Papua New Guinea with hundreds of mines that had been explored over the last 150 years, and Arian Jaya with basically the small Erzberg mine. And it's what we call state line geology. It happens all the time. Just because this terrain was so horrible uh, in terms of, of trying to explore it, and people quit at the Papua New Guinea border, and they begin to, 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 to tell themselves that this state line really was some sort of a geologic boundary. Well, that's ridiculous. Geology doesn't know political boundaries, and it never has and it never will. Moffat was convinced there was more gold in Irian Jaya's primeval hills. He told his geologists to find it. As it happened, a Freeport geologist in Irian Jaya had been thinking about gold and staring at a mountain called Grossberg, less than two miles from the Erzberg mine. Every morning I'd look up and I'd see the outcrop, I'd see that mountain sitting up there, and I'd think to myself, gee, there really should be something up there. It literally drove me nuts to stand down at the bottom of that mountain and look up at it and know that there was a rock up there that I hadn't been on. And uh, that was an itch that I just had to scratch. And after about two years, we finally got a chance to do it. The rocks Dave Potter collected on Grossberg assayed at one to two grams of gold per ton. It was enough to justify further investigation. Potter set up diamond drills and took core samples. The first one came back, uh, which was an angle hole that went directly under the outcrop. And not only did it have gold in it, it also had copper values. And for the first time, I started thinking to myself, there's something more here than just a gold deposit. The one that really drove it home was a third, the last hole that we drilled, it went over uh, about 1,500 feet deep. And out of that 1,500 feet, all of it but about 90 to 100 feet came back with copper values that were ore grade. In other words, they were on the order of 1 to 2 percent copper, on the order of 1 to as high as 5 grams per ton gold. That hole was when I suddenly felt, my God, this is big. Big was an understatement. Grossberg made mining history. Dave Potter's hunch led Freeport to a billion tons of ore, the biggest gold deposit and the third biggest copper deposit ever found. Give Mr. Moffat the credit for maintaining 
the property when he could have taken probably $75 million for it in, in the early 80s and walked away clean. You know, now Grassburg itself in the ground is worth uh, over $40 billion. $75 million, $40 billion, good choice. But as the first euphoria faded, a sobering realization took over. A wall of cliffs blocked the Erzberg Road from reaching the Grossberg. To mine its bonanza, Freeport would have to haul the world's biggest trucks and shovels up Irian Jaya's nearly vertical cliffs to a mountain even more remote than Erzberg. At Erzberg, engineers had achieved the incredibly difficult. Now, at Grossberg, they faced the impossible. Grossberg is the world's richest gold mine. It's also one of the most productive and cost efficient. Working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, its miners dig 600,000 tons of ore in a single day. To dig this staggering amount of ore, they must use the world's biggest mining equipment. Gigantic Busiris electric shovels picking up 80 tons of ore in a single scoop. And the Komatsu 930, the Leviathan of ore trucks, carrying over 300 tons in a single load. Other mines use this colossal equipment. But none has faced the task of transporting it up sheer cliffs in a remote and primitive land to a mountain peak nearly 14,000 feet high. In the 1980s, this seemed impossible. The Erzberg tramway can carry only 15 tons. A single Komatsu ore truck weighs over 200 tons. Towering cliffs block the Erzberg road from reaching the Grossberg site. In the late 1980s, the Grossberg miners faced this daunting challenge and won. This is the heat road. Heat stands for Heavy Equipment Access Trail. The heat road is unlike any other highway ever built. The heat road begins at an elevation of about 8,000 feet and traverses up the mountainside uh, for about seven miles and comes out at about 13,500 feet. Some of the grades are, are in excess of 22 to 30 percent. Branching off from the main road just below the Grossberg, the heat road zigzags straight uphill into the clouds until it reaches the mine, Freeport's stairway to heaven. The largest single contributing uh, factor to this mine is the heat road. If we didn't have the heat road, Grassberg mine would not today be moving 600,000 tons a day. Over this nightmare of a road, Colossal trucks and shovels must be brought up piece by piece, like this ore truck chassis weighing 40 tons. In places, the road seems to defy the laws of physics as its grades approach the maximum angle a fully loaded vehicle can climb. The heat road shouldn't exist. <laughs> If you look at the heat from down below, you, you don't even know what it is. When I bring people up for their first visit, they look and they just say, what is that? What's going on up there? Many said this crucial road could not be built, or if it could, its cost would be astronomical. They hadn't counted on Freeport's veteran road builder, Ilyas Hamid. Freeport asked several independent contractors from Australia to give them a, an estimate as to what it would cost to build a road. And the estimates came in in dozens and dozens of millions of dollars. He heard about these incredible estimates and he thought to himself, this is crazy. I can do this for a lot less money than what these people are asking. 
So his expat supervisor agreed to let him try. Saya pertama first. My boss took me to see the situation from the helicopter. I told him I needed a bulldozer, mechanics, and fuel. My boss said, "Okay, Elias, I give you everything you need." So the guy just drove his bulldozer from the top to the bottom. It took him a while. He didn't do it overnight, but he just zigzagged back and forth. It was the hardest work I have ever done. The bulldozer was always in danger of falling because the ground was very slippery and had very little soil on top. So the challenge was very big. When you drive a bulldozer on a on a slope as steep as the slope going up to Grasberg, you can go over any time. He almost did several times. His nerve endings are so much better than ours in sensing that fine line between toppling over in your bulldozer and dying and being able to make that cut on which other people can follow behind you. That road was built for under $2 million. Incredible, just because of one guy who had whatever it took, brave enough to go and drive his bulldozer from the top to the bottom. He's kind of a mellow guy, um, but inside I think he's, he's a tiger and he loves the challenge. And he made something amazing happen. He maybe doesn't know much about the, the world of physics. <laughs> maybe he just says, you want a road from A to B and I'll get you there. The heat road conquered Irian Jaya's mountains. But steepness is not the only obstacle to be overcome. At nearly 14,000 feet, operating one of the world's biggest mines is a daily dangerous challenge. Most mornings begin in brilliant sunshine, but by midday, clouds sweep in from the sea. Within seconds, visibility at Grossberg can drop from nearly perfect to nearly zero. Most days, the Grossberg miners must operate their Leviathan machinery in fog so dense they can barely see. The 200-ton Komatsu ore trucks, with their tires as tall as a house, could squash a smaller vehicle flat without stopping. Now, they've got very strict rules about what to do once the fog comes in, having your lights on, being X number of meters away from any other truck, who has priority. And these safety measures are followed extremely closely. Otherwise, people would be dying all over the place. Ore truck drivers like Alexander Kromsian have been trained to handle dangerous weather. If the fog is closer than 50 feet, I park my truck and wait until it disappears. I'm never frightened, although I worry a bit because the road is very narrow and slippery. Like many Grasberg employees, Alexander Kramsian is an indigenous Irianese. His truck driving skills are even more impressive than they seem. I had never operated a vehicle before. The company tested me when I came. On the first day of training, I was a little confused, but I did not find it difficult after that. 20% of my people are local Irian people local people who have never seen a Toyota before or a car and they come up and they're driving 300 ton haul trucks uh, that that's a challenge in itself and we're pretty proud of our workforce and I've I've worked at n uh, numerous mines and I put my people up against any other mines in the world Grossberg's miners won't be stopping work anytime soon Geologists believe the deposit is even bigger than originally estimated and may still contain billions of tons of ore. But Freeport has not given up its quest for new bonanzas of copper and gold. The search has sent geologists on death-defying explorations. Today, 
the Grasberg mine remains the biggest gold deposit ever found. Freeport geologists continue their search for an even bigger one. Today's scientists have tools unimagined by the explorers of the past. They pour over magnetic imagery and high-resolution satellite photography, zeroing in on potential ore bodies they call hotspots without leaving the comfort and safety of their lab. But someone's got to evaluate those hotspots. And the only way to do that is the old-fashioned way. Jay Pennington's morning commute is a little different from most. We just pop out of the helicopter basically two at a time with a sampling pack and a, uh, and a survival pack. And then we're one at a time down the hoist, say, from 100, 120 feet, so like a 12-story building. The first time I was lowered out of a helicopter, um, it was it was uh, extremely invigorating, and it was scary, and uh, it was fun all at the same time. You got to have ultimate faith in your pilot, the hoist master, who's going to have your life on the line there for about 90 seconds, and then the people that maintain the equipment, both the hoist and the helicopter. So you get through that, and let's face it, you can't do the work without that confidence. As soon as you have that, the rest of it can be as fun as you want. Exploration geologists like Jay Pennington are the front line of Freeport's search for the next Grossberg. That's good stuff. Despite all the high-tech science that leads him to a hotspot, Jay works with tools any California 49er would recognize. Eight hours a day, he pans for gold like an old west prospector in some of the last true wilderness on Earth. A lot of the times, when you hit the ground, you got to feel that no Westerner, no non-native has, has ever been where you are at that moment right there. So it, you have the potential to stumble over a 50-ounce nugget of gold, and just as easily as you can step on a, a, a rare poisonous snake. When Jay finishes sampling one hot spot, he radios for the helicopter to pick him up and take him to another one. But when a helicopter leaves Jay in the jungle, there's no guarantee it can return. You can't fly if you can't see. I mean, you don't play uh, mountain tag with a helicopter. It's not advisable. There have been times when uh, you wind up in a, in a sandwich of clouds, okay, either one, can get you from the top down or from the bottom up. And if you get a helicopter stuck in that sandwich, you're asking for real trouble. And then I'm there for the night, and that's happened a lot. When you're stuck out there, it's, it's miserable. Beyond all the adventure lies the ultimate dream, an ore body even bigger than Grossberg. In 1994, a Canadian exploration company claimed to have found it. Briax announced it had unearthed an enormous gold deposit on the neighboring island of Borneo. How enormous? 200 million ounces of gold worth $70 billion. As Briax stock skyrocketed, the Indonesian government asked Freeport to develop the Borneo Bonanza. But when Freeport's geologists finally got a chance to test Briax ore samples, they made a shocking discovery. What they were finding was particles of gold in that rock powder that were 10, 20, 50 times the size of the rest of the powder. So they were obviously salted. The gold that we found in our samples that we had drilled uh, and, uh, and processed uh, the few grains of gold we did find were very small, uh, minuscule compared to what they, uh, what they found. And, uh, and it just told us that uh, somebody had falsified the information by adding uh, gold to the samples. 
the Briax gold strike was a hoax. Freeport executives asked Michael de Guzman, Briax's chief geologist, to meet with them and explain the falsified ore samples. It was D-Day right there. That was when Steve was going to make the first confrontation and say, hey, guys, you know, what gives here? We, we, we don't think you're on the level. And uh, he never turned up for the meeting and never turned up after that anywhere. We had a, had a message uh, from Jakarta coming in where they had heard that, uh, that the Guzman had disappeared out of a helicopter. And he was the only person in the back seat of the helicopter and, uh, and supposedly opened the door and jumped out. Indonesian authorities claimed to have found de Guzman's body and ruled his death a suicide. But some believe the case is not closed. You know, the whole thing about his remains and how they were identified, it's all very questionable. Uh, I, I kind of feel like he's probably hanging out in the Philippines somewhere, <laughs> enjoying his money. <laughs> Despite the Briax hoax, Freeport continues looking for another Grossberg, a geological holy grail hidden in the mountains of Irian Jaya. Like true grail seekers, those who have braved the quest have been transformed. The country itself is so spectacularly beautiful that you well, I always said it was a religious experience to go to work in the morning because the sun was just hitting the tops of the peaks and it was, uh, it was just, just a wonderful place. Some of the things that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life and things that I have a hard time talking to other people about are things like being in a helicopter at 18,000 feet at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning and watching the sun rise over that mountain. It's magic. It's just it's unbelievable. When we were finally leaving for the last time, Ellie and I were in the helicopter, and you could hear this woof, 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 and a whole mob of natives came running down, all trotting down, all dressed up in their finery. They're saying, well, you'll be back, boys, huh? You'll be back. And, uh, and I thought we couldn't look at each other. We were both choked up on the way down, you know, knowing that was one of the best parts of your life is finished then. I think the men who build this mine I think a really an unusual bunch from the standpoint that not only were they hard workers, you can find hard workers almost anywhere in the world. I think it was a vision, a vision that they had, which I think was inspired by the kind of terrain they were working in. No place has a physical toughness and splendor that Arian has. It was really a challenge man against nature, but nature at her most unforgiving, nature at her toughest. I don't think you can find any place on Earth where nature is any tougher than this. Grossberg and Erzberg will forever remain monuments to those who discovered them, built them, and made them work. A tribute to the human courage and determination that against stupendous odds, erected a superstructure above the clouds at the ends of the earth. Rising from beneath the waves, a silent predator suddenly strikes. For almost a century, submarines have patrolled the world's oceans. Their missions, even their construction, cloaked in secrecy. Now, we'll take you where cameras have never been allowed before to witness the incredible birth of a modern nuclear submarine. About to embark on a potentially dangerous mission, this is the story of the most complex military machine of the 20th century, a superstructure called Seawolf. It's a ritual like no other. A centuries-old tradition of pomp and pageantry welcoming a new ship to the fleet. 
But while the christening of this vessel follows a time-honored custom, that's where tradition ends. This is a ship for the next century, an entirely new class of submarine meeting the water for the first time. Bearing 188 ATF SB11. Water feet feet. A showpiece of revolutionary design and construction techniques. The nuclear powered USS Seawolf takes its place in the ocean as the most advanced and lethal submarine ever created. It's taken over 3,000 workers more than a decade to build what the Navy calls the most complicated machine on Earth. The crew of Seawolf has endured years of training to earn a place aboard this mechanical marvel. She is a prototype for the Navy's undersea future. But before they can claim the title of sovereign of the ocean, man and machine must pass a complex and dangerous series of tests known as the sea trials. Bad battle station. Sierra 3-2, a submerged contact. My intentions are to engage this contact and stay course 120. The stakes could not be higher. In the post-Cold War era of budget cutbacks, the Navy is relying on Seawolf to prove it can do more with less. Contact, uh, if this ship fails her sea trials, the entire future of the Navy submarine program will be affected. Firing point procedures. The 14 officers and 124 enlisted men of Seawolf are well aware that they and the submarine's builder are under intense scrutiny. Shoot on generated bearing. The number of Seawolves approved for construction has already been slashed from 30 to 3. Workers at the electric boat company who built Seawolf have seen their numbers drop from 25,000 to 7,000. To them, a successful sea trial could mean the difference between economic life and death. Very well, City Course 050. 050 online. Chief of Watch, stand down from Battle Station. But as the world's most sophisticated weapon slowly descends beneath the waves, the ultimate test will come from the ocean itself. At bone-crushing pressures deep below the surface, there's no margin for error. There are few places in the world large enough and sophisticated enough to build a nuclear submarine. This is one of them, the Electric Boat Company's machine shop in Quonset Point, Rhode Island. For the first time ever, the company has allowed cameras inside to witness the birth of a nuclear submarine. Here, giant pipes are twisted into intricate shapes, while massive grinding machines polish tons of special metal alloys into parts that will become the body of Seawolf. There's about eight million parts on a submarine. Those parts have to fit together electronically, mechanically. The tolerances are extraordinarily close. The Electric Boat Company was co-founded by submarine pioneer John Holland in 1899. While the construction of Seawolf marks a new chapter in the history of underwater vehicles, like all subs, its life began on the design table. From the 19th century through the Cold War, submarine construction has always required enormous amounts of precise planning. For instance, on Triton, there were 10,000 drawings that defined that ship. And there were probably five or six revisions to the 10,000 drawings. So it's 60,000 pieces of paper. It's been about 30 years since we've designed a new class of submarines. And in those days, when you designed a, a submarine, you just used, used, used slide rules. There was a lot of hand calculations. And so when they designed Seawolf, it was computer-aided. It was the first time we did that. When Seawolf was designed in the 1980s, the computer revolution was just beginning. With the advent of computer-assisted design, or CAD technology, her creators could drastically reduce the staggering amount of hand calculations required. 
Now, basic design measurements such as length and diameter could be visualized in ways the early pioneers couldn't imagine. But the design process was still full of challenges. The three main problems facing modern Navy designers today were also faced by their forefathers. First, how to create a vehicle that could stay underwater for extended periods of time. Then, how to install enough weaponry to make it a viable threat. And finally, how to remain undetected. In the past, submarines were constructed by welding together steel plates to form the hull. Then the machinery, or guts of the sub, would be lowered inside through openings in the top. This was the primary method of submarine construction from World War I through the Cold War. The Cold War was one of the most volatile and dangerous times in American history. As the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union escalated, the government turned to its undersea force for defense. The Navy developed two kinds of submarine classes, the ballistic missile submarine and a smaller class of subs, the attack class. The ballistic subs, often called boomers because of their enormous firepower, were essentially large mobile platforms for launching nuclear weapons. Deployed on secret missions throughout the world's oceans, the ballistic missile submarines served as a threatening deterrent to an enemy first strike. Weapons gone. You have permission to fire. We note one. Their companion class, the attack subs, were smaller and faster than the boomers. These subs were designed to do exactly what their name implied, attack, quickly, silently, and with deadly force. Shoot! Following the Cold War, the threat of a superpower conflict decreased, while the likelihood of smaller regional conflicts increased. In response, a new kind of submarine was needed, a submarine like Seawolf. The Gulf War with Saddam Hussein actually started, the attack started with uh, a couple of uh, missiles out of a submarine, hundreds of miles away. It keeps your personnel safe, and has the ability to be used in every conceivable uh, situation. For this new class of submarine, a new building approach was employed. The Navy created Seawolf using a modular construction method. For the first time, a submarine would be built as a series of modules, with the piping, machinery, and fittings installed at the same time. This hull cylinder, about 40 feet in diameter, is about to become part of a larger, complete module. Using this new method of construction, the hull will not only be much stronger, but maintenance on the sub will also be easier. In the past, engineers would have to cut holes in the pressure hull to add or remove machinery. This time-consuming, labor-intensive process required extensive recertification tests. Now, machinery can fit through special openings that are covered by a watertight hatch, increasing the efficiency of the construction process and the strength of the hull. Even a pencil-sized puncture in the ship's hull would bring in water with the velocity of a bullet fired from a rifle. To learn how to survive against such impossible odds, the crew must now face their own certification process. That training begins here, at the Naval Submarine School in Groton, Connecticut. These trainee submariners know that someday they may face a situation of life and death, an emergency in which their response will either save the ship or send it to the bottom of the sea. During World War II, 
submarine crews in the Pacific faced impossible odds with terrifying regularity. Under constant attack from Japanese depth charges, submarines became the final resting place for thousands of American servicemen. Coming on, coming on, fire one! Despite the losses, American submarines inflicted major damage on the Japanese Navy and merchant fleet. One after the other, these steel sharks rolled out of shipyards as fast as they could be built. In response, the Japanese tried every possible method to turn back the U.S. sub fleet, including propaganda. We know very well that American submarines have headed west from Pearl Harbor. If American submariners are wise, you will turn back. Certain death awaits you over here. But neither depth charges nor propaganda could silence these warriors of the deep. Down periscope, fire! And the American submarine fleet dramatically affected the war's outcome. The submarine force represented just a mere 2% of a very, very large Navy. The submarine force, with that 2% of the Navy, sank just about 55% of all the Japanese shipping that was sunk in the entire Pacific War. Ultimately, the end of World War II was brought on by a catastrophic new weapon, an apocalyptic device using an energy source of unimaginable power. After the war's end, one man began experimenting with a way to safely harness this awesome power under the sea. He envisioned a new kind of submarine, powered by an energy source that would give it incomparable speed and stealth. His vision would lead to the awesome creation called Seawolf. Somewhere off the Atlantic coast, the world's most advanced submarine has begun its most crucial test. Make it up 300 feet. How should that ship is on order depth? Called the Alpha Trial. This is the first of three sea trials which will determine whether USS Seawolf is ready to join the fleet. Officer deck, make your depth 750 feet, 25 down. Make my depth 750 feet, 25 degree down angle, aye, sir. As it cuts silently through the water, its nuclear reactor provides an almost limitless supply of energy. Four pounds of enriched uranium will provide the same amount of energy as 10 million gallons of fuel oil used by early diesel-powered subs. The advent of nuclear power was the most important development in the history of submarine construction. And now, as the most sophisticated submarine ever built continues its top secret mission, it does so because of the dream of one man, Navy Admiral Hyman Rickover. A qualified submariner and engineer with a strong faith in both the practicality and necessity of atomic propulsion. He was a, a visionary of this business before we had the word vision. His convictions and determination soon made him a dedicated and efficient spokesman for a nuclear navy. Admiral Rickover was the first person to realize that nuclear power could turn the submarine into the most feared weapon on the planet. With this new power source, Rickover reasoned he could counteract the submarine's Achilles heel, the need for frequent resurfacing, which made them vulnerable to attack. With no precedent and no technology available for such an undertaking, he had to start from scratch. Prior to nuclear propulsion, particularly during World War II, submarines were essentially surface ships that were capable of submerging once in a while. But with nuclear propulsion, now you had a ship that was truly submersible. But translating nuclear fuel into a practical energy source presented Rickover with a paradox. On one hand, harnessing the power of the atom on a submarine would be extraordinarily complex. But once accomplished, using that power to propel the sub would be relatively simple, utilizing the same principle as a steamboat. The process begins with a nuclear reaction. As control rods carefully reveal uranium in a sealed container, extraordinary heat is produced. Liquid is then pumped through the system. It carries that heat away from the reactor core and circulates cooler temperatures back to the nuclear fuel. The liquid then flows through a heat exchanger, 
where the high temperatures are transferred to water coursing through thick pipes. This assures there can be no release of radioactive materials during the energy exchange process. This tremendous heat turns water into saturated steam. The steam powers a turbine, which drives a generator supplying all the electrical energy needed to operate the ship. Excess power is diverted to energy reserves, stored in massive banks of batteries on board. Admiral Rickover understood that nuclear engines could not only generate more power, they could give submarines virtually unlimited range. Underway on nuclear power. That was the terse message that sent the Nautilus and her crew into service. In 1955, Rickover's theory was put to the test as USS Nautilus became the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. Although the Nautilus speed is a secret, it is known to be by far the fastest submarine in the world. Three years later, Nautilus proved the submarine was now master of all the oceans, even those that were largely unexplored. In her historic four-day journey, Nautilus opened a new frontier when it crossed from the Pacific to the Atlantic under the ice of the Arctic Ocean, for the men in the submarine passing directly under the ice packs of the North Pole. Nautilus completed the first undersea transit of this hostile environment. A tumultuous harbor greeting is given the record breaker. The ship returned to a hero's welcome. A tribute to exploits that mark a new age in man's progress. A great step forward in the mastering of the seven seas. Well done. Very well done. Later in that same month, the crew of a different atomic submarine would establish a new endurance record for underwater operation. For 60 days, between August 7th and October 6th, 1958, the crew of this ship remained submerged beneath the forbidding ice flows of the North Pole. The name of that ship was USS Seawolf, predecessor to today's nuclear-powered wonder. On board today's Seawolf, submerging for 60 days is simply routine. With its nuclear-powered engines and ability to manufacture oxygen and water, Seawolf could theoretically remain underwater for years at a time. But beyond her extended range, nuclear power has also given Seawolf another important edge, speed. While her top speed is a closely guarded Navy secret, officials admit she cruises faster than 25 knots, about 30 miles per hour. Experts privately acknowledge Seawolf can actually travel much faster. Well, it's funny. People try to, to figure out how fast a ship goes, and they always ask the crew, and the crew will say, they have an acronym, and they say it goes so fantastically fast that stuff falls off. You know, that's, that's their little joke, but they won't tell you for sure how fast it goes. It, it, is certainly a, it is certainly a sports car compared to the other ones. Elm, left 10 degrees, rudder, city course 080. In fact, even the designers of this undersea sports car were surprised by how fast she really is. The ship is tremendously faster than what they expect, and people don't believe it. You go back to some of the scientists who did the original calculations, they refuse to believe it. For all its high-tech power, Seawolf is still a warship. And life aboard this ship is no pleasure cruise. Every square inch of Seawolf is designed for maximum efficiency, which doesn't leave much room for human comforts. The crew eats in shifts. Over 130 men will pass through this compact galley three times each day. Space and privacy aboard Seawolf are luxuries the crew learn to live without. Even their sleeping quarters are designed for efficiency. The reason why, why you call it hot racking or hot bunking is you have three guys to two racks. Uh, the reason why you have that is because you don't have enough space available for each member of the crew. Uh, the reason why they call it hot racking is because while you always have one on watch, you have two in the rack, and when that person gets off watch, that rack is still warm from the other person. So that's pretty much why they call it. And plus you jump around from rack to rack, you'll never sleep in the same rack twice. It's not uncommon for some sailors to actually sleep in the torpedo cradles. 
luxurious accommodations for taller men frustrated by confined bunks. Because space aboard a submarine is at a premium, maximizing every available inch has always started with the design phase. During the 1980s, Seawolf designers were able to use emerging technologies to increase available space. For example, CD-ROM technology meant thousands of technical manuals and drawings required on early subs could be replaced by compact discs. No minor achievement, this freed up 350 cubic feet of space and eliminated over six tons of paper on board. A major tactical advantage of Seawolf is her arsenal of computers. This massive network of incredibly powerful machines are the most ever used on any naval vessel. Her communication software alone uses six million lines of programming code. Seawolf submarine is probably the most complex product built by man in the world today. If you took uh, the floppy disks, 1.4 megabit uh, floppy disks, and took the data that's in this submarine and, and stored them in those floppy disks, they would be taller than the World Trade Center. There's just an enormous complexity of material, science, machines, computers. Detection bearing 273, classified biologics. The computer-driven sensor systems on Seawolf are so advanced, they can even pick up the most minute, natural sounds of the deep. What you're hearing is shrimp feeding in the cold waters of the Atlantic. The crew listens as dolphins swarm in for lunch. But beyond just hearing faint natural sounds, Seawolf sensors can detect and identify even the most silent of ships by their sound signatures. Today's acoustic sensors, both on the submarine and also towed behind the submarine, have allowed us to be able to detect very quiet submarines and surface ships out to thousands and thousands of yards in range, out to many, many nautical miles. Those sensors combined with very improved and highly capable heavyweight torpedoes give us the capability to attack both submarines and surface ships almost at will. Crew members say the difference between Seawolf and non-nuclear submarines is like comparing a biplane to a jet. But for all its space-age capabilities, the job of traveling beneath the sea remains extremely dangerous. And no mission is more dangerous than the Alpha Trial, the submarine's first meeting with the sea. As the crew of USS Seawolf continues their shakedown voyage, a mission from decades earlier casts an ominous shadow. A mission in which another nuclear submarine was being tested. A mission that would be cut short by tragedy. A tragedy that would shock a nation and forever change the nature of submarine construction. newest nuclear submarine, the Thresher, is launched at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. When USS Thresher was launched in July 1960, she was the first of her kind, a new class of submarine. Like the crew of Seawolf, Thresher faced a regular series of tests designed to further submarine exploration. But on April 10th, 1963, the incredible danger associated with any undersea journey became all too clear. At 7.47 p.m., about 200 miles east of Boston, Thresher began a deep descent known as a test dive. For reasons still unknown, at 9.13 p.m., the ship radioed a message that it was experiencing minor difficulties and was attempting to blow its ballast tanks, a procedure used to surface during an emergency. Four minutes later, a garbled message was received. Then, the horrifying sound of the ship breaking up. USS Thresher, along with her crew of 129 men, was gone. It was, it was a chilling, uh, a chilling and memorable day. It was almost like where you were when the president was assassinated. So I 
this was also that year. As ships and deep diving equipment scoured the ocean for the wreckage, investigators began a decades-long quest to find out why she sank. In a remarkable series of pictures, the Navy photographs the ill-starred sub. In one photo, her number shows clearly. The tail section with the stern planes is plainly visible here. Navy submersibles found what was left of Thresher in June of 1963 at a depth of over 8,000 feet. A Navy Court of Inquiry, however, was never able to fully determine the exact cause of her demise. No Navy official was more devastated by the loss of Thresher than the father of nuclear submarines, Admiral Rickover. While some critics attacked the performance of the ship's nuclear reactor, Rickover believed that submarine construction itself must change. He lobbied for improved fabrication techniques, better inspection methods, and more attention to emerging technologies and new ways of thinking. When we lost the Thresher, we went from what had been a proactive approach to building submarines to a very strong reactive approach, and it focused our uh, engineering discipline into what do we have to do to make a submarine safe for the people in the harsh environment, not just in wartime, but in peacetime too. And so Thresher is not only historical memory, we remind people of Thresher as part of our submarine education and training. We go around and remind them the consequences of not adhering rigorously to, to the technical specifications and the processes. So it's still the backdrop for the subsafe program. You know, here it is 34 years later. The design and construction of submarines are highly specialized crafts, constantly being revised to accommodate new technologies. As technologies develop, the workers who build subs must also adapt, continually undergoing rigid certification tests which measure their skill and expertise. Even the body of Seawolf is made from a new material. The hulls of early subs were made from a high-strength steel called HY-80. This material could withstand pressure of 80,000 pounds per square inch. The Seawolf-class submarines are created using a new super steel called HY-100, able to withstand 100,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. This means that designers can now create submarines which can dive deeper than their predecessors of the same weight, although just how deep is classified. Or they can create new lighter weight subs, capable of reaching the same depths as the earlier heavier subs. But regardless of its weight, a submarine's effectiveness has always been judged by its ability to remain undetected. Once at sea, an engine hum, a mechanical noise, even a crew member's conversation could reveal the ship's location with deadly consequences. Stealth is the most important thing. A submarine maintains its capability and its safety by never being detected. For example, if there's a conflict, a hot conflict somewhere in the world, submarines, especially the US submarines, usually the first war fighting or peacekeeping platform on the scene, and it, it does that without being detected. It can then provide information with surveillance, feed that information back to the president, uh, and sort of the, the decisions can be made. And the submarine has the capability of doing that quietly, quickly, and it's virtually undetectable. Two things you know. They know we have them, and we can be there fast. And two, even when they don't know we're there, they're not sure we're not there, because these things are stealth. So they could be thinking that, well, maybe around the corner there's an American sub, or maybe it's just off a little bit. And that will prevent countries, I think, from doing foolish things. And after all, that's much preferable to actually going to war. To maintain stealth, every joint and substructure within the ship is designed to minimize sound and vibration. Even operating at top speed, Sea Wolf will be quieter than the older submarines were when idling at the pier. It's quieter than any other submarine in the world, and that required an enormous amount of technology in quieting things like switches and valves and hydraulic piping. 
The ship's inner decks are not attached directly to the hull, but rest on rubber mountings to reduce vibrations. Other sophisticated anti-detection strategies are also integrated into the construction process. Propellers are designed to produce minimal noise. Anti-detection tiles made from sound-absorbing plastic compounds line the inside of the hull. And finally, an additional layer of sound-absorbing material is applied to the hull's exterior when finished. While the ship is cloaked by a silent defense, its stealth-like capabilities also create a formidable offensive weapon. Whether gathering covert electronic intelligence, monitoring an enemy's shipping lanes, or detecting and deploying mines, Sea Wolf will be able to get in and out of dangerous waters faster than any warship ever created. But sometimes, the most deadly threat to a submarine crew comes from inside the ship. Fire in the engine room, fire in the bilge. I think probably the fire is, is the worst thing to have happen to you. Because, you know, that's something very quickly, if you don't do the right thing, you can get out of control. As you see, this is an enclosed environment. This is all we have. If you get a big fire going, it gets very hot here in a hurry and very, very hazardous, and there's nowhere else to go. Trapped hundreds of feet below the ocean's surface, a fire could wipe out a crew in an instant or slowly consume the ship's life-giving oxygen supplies. It is a terrifying scenario, but one that is planned for in the design of a ship, in its construction, and at the Naval Submarine School. Fire's out. New flash watch is set. This training doesn't end once on board. Class Bravo, fire in the galley, fire in the deep fat fryer. There's heavy smoke in the galley. I'm paying for calling the main charge. On a submarine, crew members constantly rehearse and plan for every conceivable situation. There's heavy black smoke in the galley. We are currently searching for hot spots with the next thing. When building a military craft like Sea Wolf, designers must also plan for every eventuality. The most obvious and most dangerous is combat. Like an aircraft carrier, a submarine is divided into separate watertight sections. This way, if a torpedo should penetrate the hull, or if a fire should start in one section, the rest of the ship is still able to function. Make your depth 750 feet, 25 down. 750 feet, 25 degree dead angle. I serve full dive on the stern plane. 25 degree dead angle. If the crew of USS Seawolf can pass its sea trials, it will be judged ready for combat. Close about 2,000 yards. In about four minutes, we'll be at the firing point. Tomahawk shape going to pivot tray A level. Starboard side, clear. Carrying an arsenal of lethal weapons that can be targeted with pinpoint accuracy, the ship will patrol the seas with more military power than many countries possess. Weapons coordinator, Captain, reports status of uh, two bay. Thanks, Mr. Peter. Normal launch, two bay. A silent and deadly predator, Sea Wolf will be the most advanced, heavily armed attack submarine the world has ever seen. All stations, rival path is direct path. Carry on. As the pieces of a new nuclear submarine are forged at this historic shipyard, workers at the Electric Boat Company now face an imposing task transporting the giant sections to their dry dock facilities in Groton, Connecticut. To do this, modules weighing over 700 tons each are placed on the largest transport truck in the world. There are only two such vehicles in existence, and both were specially made to assist in submarine construction. When these two vehicles are used together, workers can move modules weighing over 1,400 tons. Now, they will travel by barge for the 60-mile journey from this Rhode Island machine shop to the Connecticut dry dock facility. 
As the pre-assembled pieces arrive at the dry dock, they are suspended in order and then pieced together to form the complete ship. Many months of assembly have been condensed into seconds to see this amazing process in action. As the pieces of this $2 billion puzzle are carefully assembled, even top-ranking Navy officials are amazed by the complexity of the operation. The design, development, and construction of a submarine, I view it very much like uh, eating an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. If the assembly of this submarine happens one bite at a time, then these are its sharpest teeth, the weapon systems. Now, with its body almost complete, the deadly arsenal is installed. On board Seawolf, four levels of robotically controlled storage racks can deploy a lethal force on a moment's notice. Man battle station. Its Tomahawk cruise missiles can be placed with pinpoint accuracy, guided by a global positioning satellite. I guess we could talk about San Diego to San Francisco. That's about 520 miles. I would say that if this missile took off from uh, Jack Murphy Stadium, you could put it uh, right about between Pitcher's Mound and Second Base down there in Candlestick Park. Seawolf's anti-submarine missiles make her a fearsome underwater force as well. She has stealth, she has improved sensors, and she has maneuverability. All, everything that makes a fighter aircraft superior is what Seawolf brings to that underwater dogfight. Seawolf is the most sophisticated military craft ever created. But the road leading up to this 20th century superstructure actually began hundreds of years ago. It was a road paved with danger. In 1775, only 25 miles from the site of the electric boat company, a young Irishman named David Bushnell built this device called the Turtle. Driven by his intense hatred of the British and with the support of George Washington, Bushnell created an underwater craft that could place an explosive device on harbored British warships. Its name came from the design, resembling two turtle shells, seven feet long and four feet wide. This craft of wood, iron, and leather could approach an enemy ship with a hand-cranked propeller and was able to stay submerged 20 feet below the surface for almost 30 minutes. Unfortunately, when Bushnell's device was tried on a British man of war, the attaching screw could not penetrate the copper sheathing on the hull. The turtle was lucky to escape. But the theory of this unique weapon delivery system survived. The underwater sneak attack was born. During the Civil War, both sides developed submarines, but it was a Confederate version invented by Horace L. Hunley that became the first sub to record a torpedo hit on an enemy ship. It was a milestone that came with a terrible cost. The 60-foot H.L. Hunley used a crew of eight to turn its propeller crankshaft, towing a single torpedo behind it. In 1864, in the Charleston, South Carolina Harbor, the Hunley delivered its deadly cargo against the Union's USS Housatonic. The attack did little damage to the Union ship, but the exploding torpedo sank the Hunley. As primitive as these early craft appear, they actually use the same engineering principle as today's modern subs, the ability to submerge and surface by adding or subtracting ballast. I went at 750 feet, used 25 degree down angle ISER. During her sea trials, one of Seawolf's most critical challenges will be her ability to perform deep dives. Inside the hull are ballast tanks designed to temporarily fill with water. In the original sub-designs, the ballast tanks were located port and starboard, as shown here. When the tanks fill with water, negative buoyancy is created, causing the vessel to sink. When compressed air flushes the water from the compartments, buoyancy returns and the ship rises. 700 feet, coming to 300 feet. Seawolf also employs this basic principle of physics. But the ballast tanks on this ship are located fore and aft, so the ship can submerge or surface with incredible speed. 
Roger, the ship is on order at 300 feet, sir. The propulsion of early subs required exhaustive manual labor performed in suffocating spaces with no fresh air. These ships could only dive for brief periods, staying close to the surface in order to ventilate the craft. On board Seawolf, the same nuclear power that propels the ship also supplies the crew with life-giving oxygen. Water molecules are formed from two hydrogen atoms spinning around a single oxygen atom. On Seawolf, sophisticated machines use electromagnetic force to disengage the hydrogen atoms from the molecular structure, leaving pure oxygen for the ship's life support system. But it was another source of energy that first turned the submarine into a viable fighting machine. John Philip Holland was an industrious Irish immigrant who pioneered a double propulsion system for submarines. Holland's boat used a 50 horsepower gas engine for surface sailing and then to keep the air breathable, a battery operated motor while submerged. This dual engine approach to underwater navigation gave the sub greater range and submergence capability, something that US Navy officials realized in 1900. Able to dive to just over 100 feet, the Irishman's craft became the first submarine commissioned by the Navy. The crew of USS Holland became pioneers of a new world under the sea. Over the next 14 years, 25 more of these amazing devices called submarines were built. But beneath the waves, the United States would not be alone for long. May 1915, the ocean liner Lusitania is fired upon and sunk by a German U-boat. In under 20 minutes, over 1,100 passengers die, many of them Americans. The U.S. moves one step closer to war with Germany. During World War I, the potential of this new machine would be put to the ultimate test. The age-old ritual of enemies facing each other in head-to-head -head combat was replaced by the sneak attack. Gyro 005 at Gracie, shoot anytime. Fire. The dream of John Holland and the early submariners forever changed the nature of warfare. I think certainly that Holland, uh, when he designed and built uh, his first craft, uh, probably never recognized um, where we would be today. John Holland might never have imagined a vessel like Seawolf. But to the Navy, it marks the beginning of an entirely new class of submarine, high-tech subs that will begin in virtual reality and end up resembling science fiction. But first, Seawolf must prove to the Navy and the public that her design is sound, that her crew is ready. Now, as she nears the end of her crucial maiden voyage, the future of the next generation of subs hangs in the balance. Propulsion and life support systems have been tested. She has performed rapid dives to classified depths. Under stressful warfare scenarios, she has been deemed combat ready. As the end of USS Seawolf's maiden voyage draws near, Captain Dave McCall has witnessed what billions of dollars worth of machinery and a highly trained crew can really do. While young in age, McCall's crew are ready to become submariners. It's $2.3 billion for this ship. And the first underway watch station an 18-year-old stands or occupies is he's driving this ship. He has his hands on the wheel of a $2.3 billion sports car. And uh, that's a lot of responsibility. You have to want that kind of responsibility. You have to be ready to take it. And, uh, and they choose themselves. They have trained, rehearsed, and drilled. Now it's time to come home. But as Seawolf ends her maiden voyage, she is bringing back more than just the crew. Over 100 workers of the electric boat company have gone with her on this dangerous but crucial first journey. While these shipbuilders were on board to perform tests and gauge the success of their handiwork, they also wanted to send a message. This was a ship that had been constructed properly, and they would put their lives on the line to prove it.
They've literally worked uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years with very little time off. Years of hard work and grueling training have led to this one moment, the return of USS Seawolf to her base in Groton, Connecticut. To the trained observer, the presence of a simple wooden broom attached to the ship's superstructure tells them everything they need to know. The ship has performed a clean sweep of its first major test. The mission is a success. It's probably our finest ship in the water today. It performs beyond expectations. After seeing it start from uh, the early stages of design, uh, early stage of construction where we just started bending steel, to watch the crew bring it alive, start operating it. Uh, we've been through a lot of major obstacles that would have normally brought another project to its knees and stopped it. Against a backdrop of budget cuts and shifting political power structures, the designers, builders, and crew of USS Seawolf have achieved a stunning victory. Under a mandate to do more with less, they have rewritten the book on how to build a submarine. Now, the success of Seawolf will provide a blueprint for the submarine of the next century, a vehicle known simply as the New Attack Submarine. When production of these sleek new subs begins, they will be able to do everything Seawolf can, but cost less to build. That's because advancements in computer technology, just beginning when Seawolf was constructed, now provide designers with incredible new tools. Tools today give us collectively as a community, the Navy, electric boat, our suppliers, the ability to go in fact integrate the very best design very early in the program. This 3D generated sailor named Ergo Man is an example of this new space age technology. Virtual reality programs like these enable designers to see what these subs will be like for human inhabitants before construction even begins. We gotta verify how, how low can we drop the sump. Another significant change based on Seawolf's success is a brand new approach to the management of subconstruction. In video teleconferences like this, the workers who will build the sub and the men who will travel in them interact with the designers and engineers at every phase of development. Jimmy, if you just want to circle that, so our friends down in Washington can see that. That flange, we're, we're possibly talking about eliminating. Today, we're not interested who comes up with a good idea. We make it a team effort to go produce the very best design for this country that we can produce. And that's exciting, and that's different than it's been in the past. Seawolf and the new attack submarine are designed to evolve with technologies of the future. Soon, even the venerable periscope itself, a staple of submarines throughout history, may be replaced by powerful liquid plasma display screens. With the success of their first sea trial, the crew of Seawolf will continue a long and distinguished tradition. Even though this is a new ship with a young crew, they are traveling in the footsteps of those who have gone before, many of whom did not return. These are the names of United States submarines lost in the service of duty with all hands on board. Submariners say these ships and the men aboard them remain on eternal patrol. We'll also be checking the tubes, uh, shooting... No uh, one is more aware of the dangers of the deep than the men who will ultimately certify the vessel as being ready to join the fleet. Good. Yes, sir. Head this way. I am the person who signs for a submarine that it's ready to go to sea and it's sub-safe. And we do that through a very rigorous, disciplined process that literally takes thousands of hours of documentation, test, and, and retest. Had Seawolf failed on its first mission, the consequences for the Navy would have been disastrous. Thousands of jobs, billions of dollars, and the lives of the crew were at stake. Now, for the thousands of men and women who created her, Seawolf's successful first voyage is a time of great emotion. Well, you know, the day I give up the ship is gonna be kinda of like the day I give up my daughter to her husband at her wedding. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a hard day. The design and construction of a nuclear submarine requires the imagination and determination of thousands. Forged from silicon and steel, they are born in giant factories. 
But here, beneath the waves, is where they will spend most of their lives. By the time Seawolf ends her final mission, it's difficult to imagine how far man will have ventured into the realm of the deep ocean. But waiting in the wings will be an entirely new class of undersea superstructures. I hereby certify that he is qualified in submarines on board USS Seawolf. And a new generation of submariners, piloting these guardians of the deep into the next century and beyond. Congratulations, Pastor Rogar. Thank you, sir.